Y'all want to wave at the camera? All right. Hey. All right, good. All right, so we are Titus. Don't turn there because we're going to have our uh, questions. And it's this side, Team Daryl against Team Marguerite. I don't know who I would have my money on were I a betting man. But anyway, are you ready? ready. We'll let Team Daryl go first because I have to go home with her. All right. <laughs> This is an easy one. By the way, I'll be keeping score. And uh, whoever wins, good job. Who wrote? Y'all don't be nervous now. Okay, don't worry about that over there. <laughs> Who wrote? Titus. You can raise your hand or you can yell it out. Paul. Yes, sir, in the back. Paul. Very good. Paul is the right answer. Paul. Good job. All right. Mr. Team Marguerite. What is the phrase that Paul uses to describe his relationship to Titus? What is the phrase Paul True uses? Brother in faith. You are so close. That was son. True son. True. True son. Beloved son. True son in the faith. I'll give you that. <laughs> nice work. All right, Team Daryl. In what city did Paul leave Titus? In what city did he leave him in? I know the answer. Crete. Crete. That's right. Oh, These are just too easy. All right. <laughs> Team Marguerite, what did Paul direct Titus to do while he was in Crete? It's uh, two things. I, if you get one of them, I'll count. Mm -hmm. What did Paul direct Titus? Everything I'm telling you is like within the first four verses. Don't you up me, Bob? <laughs> you got to make sure you're setting a good example. What did Paul direct Titus to do while he was in Crete? He talks about selecting elders for the church. Appointing elders for the church. Yes, that's one of them. And then the other one was set. Uh, let me see here. Let me get the right. Set right what was left undone and appoint elders in every town. Team Daryl Paul describes what an elder must be. Name three of the characteristics. There are a bunch of them, so three shouldn't be too hard. If you think of First Timothy 3, you'll probably hit some of them. What are three characteristics that must be true of an elder? Husband of one wife. That's, right. see. That's one of them, but not in this list. <laughs> That's in the First Timothy list. <laughs> so, uh, what? Pure. Okay, blameless, pure. That's one. That's actually the one. In, the one you just said about the wife. Whoever said that? That's the only one that's not repeated in here. So, uh, yes. Okay, pure, blameless. Same. That. That's one. Uh, not a drunkard. Yep. Two. in control of their children and household kind of thing. Self-control. That'll count. <laughs> All right. The Marguerite. According to Titus, an elder is also called a what? Oh. Can we steal? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Okay. We don't talk about stealing in church. Right. It's a like game. Just a minute. What did? Let, mm. Mm -hmm. Pastor Deacon? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It's not Deacon. They are all men. <coughs> what? Men. They are all men. Uh, well, that's not what I'm looking for. Is that your final answer? <coughs> no, that is not it. <laughs> Overseer. Overseer. <laughs> Y'all owe him something. That was not wrong. All right. Uh, I'll go back to y'all because you got that one wrong. Um, let's see here. Paul encouraged the elders in Creek to do two things. Give me one of them. He encouraged the elders in Creek to do two things. Give me one of them. I don't know if it's the elders in particular, but I know that they're... <coughs> Their faith should be influencing the way that they live, so they should look different. That's, That's kind of broad. <laughs> but, yeah. Come on, Team D. T team M. <laughs> yeah. so, You're Team M. <laughs> team M. Um, I know that they were supposed to, like... Because so there were Jewish people like of the circumcision party that were causing issues in the church, and they were supposed to like call out false teachers, refute 
Very good. The other one was encourage and refute. Nice work. Team D. Let's see. Paul talked about rebellious teachers. What was their motivation for teaching? What was their mo? It's one word. That's everybody seems like motivation for everything. You're giving them too many clues. <laughs> You're on team M. You know, just a moment. Just a moment. What was their motivation for teaching? Because they're all the opposite team. Right. That is not correct. <gasps> It's money. It is money. <laughs> that is money. All right. Let's see. Y'all got that wrong, so I'll come back to you. All right. We have two more. Paul said older women, not anyone in here, is to teach the younger women, all of the ladies in here, to do what? First. This is the only thing. We're going to talk about it in a minute. He said that, that older women are supposed to do these things, but then he says you're to teach the younger women to do something. What is it? Hold on. Is it submission? It is not submission. Yes. Can we talk about our answers um, before? Yeah. Yes. It is love their heart. <laughs> we all know to leave. Last question. Whoever raises a hand first gets it. Who else, if you were listening last time we met, you will know the answer to this. Who else did Paul mention by name in the book of Titus? There's a couple people. Yeah. He mentions Apollo, Apollos at the end. Are you sure? She didn't raise her hand. it. Hmm? She did raise her hand. She did raise her hand. I was just talking at the same time. <laughs> but no, he's Easy, like, worth three the these people, and then I'll talk to these people. I think there's like four. Could you find it for me? I just want to make sure I'm right. Because I did not so, find anybody else named. Okay. We'll look at the book this In three twelve, when I said okay. Artemis or Tychicus to you. Okay. But then, but wait, wait. Well, you named two other people. Do your best to speed Zenus the lawyer and a. You named two other people. You good? Okay. Team Marjorie came point back point from point behind. And one. <laughs> but Pat, three amongst yourselves. Only one. Don't get mad if you don't like the color, or the flavor. You get what you get, however that goes. That's right. You don't throw a fit. I like it to run. All right. You can turn to Titus now. There's no danger of cheating. Titus, we'll, uh, we'll look at chapter two first. And please understand there is a lot in here that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we don't give it to the team that did not succeed. But thank you for showing Christ like example because I wasn't doing that. Let's try to be generous. Very good. All right. There is, uh, we're going to be in chapter two first. There is a lot about Titus that I will not get to. What I am going to talk to you about is my favorite text. And the reason it is, is just because uh, it just, when I read it, it, it overwhelms me. And I'll explain why it's nothing new. It's nothing you haven't heard before. But I hope it will, it will, it will serve as a great reminder. So let me tell you my first encounter with Titus. Uh, I grew up in a very strict home. Uh, King James Bible, uh, church all the time, tie, you understand? Suit if I had one. Uh, Southern gospel music slash hymns only. Uh, when I was at school, I went to a Christian school, and some of my buddies started listening to this dude named Stephen Curtis Chapman. Yes, that was a long time ago. And then this group called DC Talk. <laughs> And I thought, I've got to have this because that's the only way I can walk closer with Jesus is to have Stephen Curtis Chapman and DC talk. Stephen Curtis Chapman was not a big, a hard sell with my parents because, you know, it, it, he's not, you know, he's not DC talk. And so uh, I started talking to my parents, you know, easing them into DC talk. How many of you have no idea who DC talk is? Okay, wonderful. So I started easing into the conversation. Mom and dad, they sing about Jesus. They said, let me listen to a song. So I turned it on, and let's just say it didn't go well. <laughs> uh, the only song they sang that my parents knew was Lean On Me. They, they did a remake of that song on an on a, on a album called Free At Last. If you don't have that, I'm not sure you're a Christian. Just kidding. Uh, anyway, 
I eased them into it. They listened to it. They didn't like it. And so we went on vacation that year, and we were at a mall, uh, we, wherever we were. Uh, there was a mall. We were getting ready to leave to go back home. And I finally convinced them to let me get a DC Talk cassette tape after the biggest argument I've ever had in my life with my, with my parents. And that's the truth. Uh, that was the biggest argument I ever had with my parents. And so uh, the mall, we went to the mall. The music store didn't open till 10. We were there at 930. So strike one, it was DC Talk. Strike two, the mall store, the, the music store wasn't open yet. And so I made them wait around. And uh, when the music store opened, I went in and they didn't have it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, I'm convinced that was the devil just standing in the way. Uh, but I ended up getting the tape and that uh, that's how I got into contemporary Christian music. What does that have to do with Titus? I'm going to tell you. One of my favorite uh, singers, who she is not anymore, is named Jennifer Knapp. Have you all ever heard of her? Uh, she is not someone I would encourage you to listen to now. She has since walked away from the faith. And But anyway, she had a song on one of her albums, and this was the line in the song. To the pure, all things are pure, but those who defile in believing, nothing is pure. I had no earthly idea what that meant, but it came from Titus. So that was actually my introduction to the book of Titus. And of course, since then, uh, in school and stuff, I've read it multiple times. But that was my introduction to the book of Titus. Had no idea what it meant, but found out that's where it came from. So that was my uh, first encounter, let's say, with Titus. So let me ask you, <coughs> I know some of you were cramming before I came in here reading Titus. I won't call any names, team email. Oh, uh, but anyway, uh, does anybody have favorite passage or favorite, favorite verse from the book of Titus? If you have not read it, that is okay. I would encourage you to do so, uh, maybe between now and by the way, we won't meet again until January 7th. We will not meet in December because they're having a journey to Bethlehem meeting same day that we would typically meet. So January 7th will be our next one. Um, does anybody have a favorite verse or text? I don't know if it's my favorite, but um, I like in 1, 2, mm -hmm. where it talks about how God who never lies. Yeah. And I hadn't really thought about this before, but I was watching the Bible project. Mm -hmm. yes. And he was talking about how Paul put this in to contrast like the one true God with like Zeus and the other mm -hmm. Greek gods because um, I guess Crete is Greek. Um, and so that's what they would have known. And so right. a lot of times they would mix up their views of God. So I love that he puts that in there. Yeah. Like this is something that sets right. our God apart. Right. Very good. Anybody else? I liked the first, the beginning of chapter three. Okay. Oh. Don't say too much, please, because I think that's where I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. okay, yes, it fine. is. You can just say you liked it and stop there, yes. and I'll cover some of it. <laughs> I don't want you to teach the lesson for me, you know. We have trouble with some people in here doing that. <laughs> my verse was right there, too. So. All right, very good. Uh, that is actually my favorite text, and we'll get to that. So uh, let me go. Uh, I know when we've done this before, I've shared verses that, that just stood out to me. They weren't necessarily my favorite, and I want to do that first before we get to my favorite. So look at chapter 2. Um, we, for sake of time, we won't read it all. I do want you to focus on, um, it'll be verse 5 and verse 3. Paul is talking to the older women, and he tells them, and we've already mentioned this in the questions, he tells them to do, to, to teach something. What, do you remember what it was? He's to teach, that they're to teach the younger women. What was it? What is good? To love their husband, right? They're supposed to be all of these things. And then he says, teach the younger women to love your husband. Now, I've actually heard people tell me that the Bible never commands a wife to love her husband. What, what do we know that it does say? Everybody, men especially, not the ones in here necessarily, men especially know this verse. What does it say? Respect. Women are to Respect. submit. So let me tell you something about that real quick. If a husband loves his wife the way Christ loves the church, it will be no problem submitting to them. Submission is a response to Christ-like love. But here we see the refute for that. If somebody ever says that to you, the Bible never commands a wife to love their husband. They don't know this. Because Paul tells the older women, teach the younger women to love their husbands. Here's why that stands out to me. Look at the end of verse 5. 
Now, my version may be a little bit different. It says, so that God's word, now this is the end of what he's telling the older women to teach the younger women and the older women how they're supposed to live their lives. So that God's word will not be what? Reviled or slandered. Much of what goes on in a church with the word of God is not just from the preaching and the teaching. It's from the way we choose to live our lives toward our spouses. And I think that that stands out to me because I think sometimes, and I had this discussion with somebody this week in one of my classes, I think sometimes we forget, when we think of spiritual leadership, who do we typically think that's left up to? The man, right? The husband, the pastor, um, the man, right? And in some respects, that's true. Some respects, it's not. But I think sometimes, and, and I don't think churches do a great job of teaching the power and authority that women have, especially wives and mothers. You remember King Solomon? Who turned his heart from the Lord? His wives. You think about all of the kings, all these kings that are listed in Kings and Chronicles. A lot of them that, that didn't do what God said, their mother's name is mentioned. So don't, I'm not saying y'all don't understand this, but when you teach your daughters and you teach your granddaughters, teach them the importance of loving people, loving their spouse, even though they may not have one yet, because they could hinder the word of God by not doing that. And if they're not doing that, we're hindering the word of God by not teaching them that. Now, I've told my daughters, you know, when they get married at age 80, they're supposed to love their, their husbands, right? But I think we need, to, we need to mark that in our Bibles. We need to put it up here as we teach our daughters to love their husbands so that the word of God is not slandered. And I think that should scream of great importance to us. Tammy can attest to this. We see kids every day at this preschool are not being taught that. Uh, I, I, my daughters interact with kids at a Christian school that are not being taught that. And it starts not in the church, it starts in our homes. So the word of God is not slandered. So the way that we teach our children tells us how much, how valuable we count the word of God. That's not my favorite, but it's something that stood out to me. So let's go to my favorite, chapter three. Titus chapter three. Before we get to that, I need you to do something for me. Um, and some people have advised me not to ask you to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, all of us have had somebody who have hurt us, right? We've all had somebody, someone in our life who has crucified us, so to speak. Uh, for some of us, it may be a coworker or a spouse or a child or someone in this church or someone who doesn't go to this church anymore. We've all had someone who has hurt us. I want you to think of that one person. I don't mean a group of people. Maybe it is a group for you. Think of that person, see their face, and remember their name. Got somebody? Now, I'm not asking you to think of somebody you haven't forgiven. I'm asking you to think of somebody that hurt you deeply. You got somebody? Do this if you have. Everybody, don't forget their name. Okay? Now, Titus chapter 3. Paul wrote to Titus, who was his son in the faith, he, he uh, Paul had been in Crete. He, he began new churches. He left Titus to help get those churches in order to establish elders and do all of those things. <coughs> and it's interesting when uh, Paul instructs Titus to deal with false teachers, he tells them to refute what they said. And the interesting thing is the way that, that Paul throughout the book tells him to refute those things is to live a godly life in response to what they're saying. Um, the one thing people can't argue with is a godly life changed by the gospel. Nobody can argue with that because that's your testimony. So that's kind of the background of what's happening throughout this whole book. And then we get to chapter 3, and it begins in an interesting way. It kind of mirrors Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Look at verse 1. What does he tell Titus to remind them of? And it doesn't matter who the them is right now, just for we're not going to get into all of that. But what does he say, remind them of? To do what? Submit to authority. Submit to authority. Do you have a problem with that? I do sometimes. I have had authority over me who wasn't very Jesus-y. I'm not talking about here. I've worked with people who weren't very Jesus-y. 
Um, probably some of you have as well. <clears throat> Paul says, remind them to submit to authority. And then in verse 2, he, he says some things. So let's look at that. Don't slander them. Avoid fighting with them. Be kind always, showing gentleness to all people. Now, when I read that, I'm thinking the reason I have to be told to be kind is because there's somebody who's not being kind to me. Because if you're being kind to me, you really don't have to tell me to be kind back. It's easy. So that kind of lets me know that Paul is telling Titus, you're going to have some masters who stink, right? They're not kind to you. They don't do the right things in the way that they treat you. And he says, don't slander them, be kind to them, and do what they've asked you to do, provided that it doesn't go against what the Lord says. Be gentle to them. Um, <coughs> when you hear the word slander, what does that mean to you? Discredit. Discredit, good. Talk bad about them. Talk bad about them, what else? Say things that aren't true. Right. All of those are right. It also goes a step further. And it means accuse them. It doesn't just mean speak bad about them. It means don't even accuse them of something wrong. Um, don't do that stuff, even if they do it to you. Now, let's go to verse 3. I want you to look at verse 3. Read it to yourself. I'll read it out loud. And as you're reading it, I want you to think about when you were this way, when this was your description. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and detesting one another. Any of those words ever describe you? Unfortunately, sometimes they describe us now. Do you know why that description is so awful to me when I think about how I was when I was in college and, and even before that? The reason it was so awful for me is because I was so deceptive. If you knew me when I was in, you know, 11th, 12th grade and into college, um, you would not have believed I was not a Christian because I knew all of the answers to all of the questions. I grew up in church. I knew all of the songs, DC Talk, Stephen Curtis Chapman, any of the Southern Gospel stuff you want to name. I knew how to, how to fool you. And to me, that was what was so horrifying when I read this. It wasn't that I was outright, you know, deceptive or, or outright ugly or mean to you. It's that I was this way in front of you. And when I went home or I went away from my parents, I was the devil. And I think sometimes we forget what we were. And Ty, uh, Paul is reminding Titus, don't forget, don't live in who you were, but don't forget it either. Don't live in Egypt, but don't forget you came from there. Do you know why some of us fail in loving Jesus with all we have? Because we forget what Jesus pulled us from. Mm -hmm. Jesus pulled me out of that stuff. Um. There was pornography. There was all kinds of junk. And Jesus took me from that. And when we forget where we've come from, we forget how we're supposed to love Jesus. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So Paul reminds Titus, what a great thing. Hey, remember, you stunk, okay? You were awful. And verse 4 has maybe the most precious word in Scripture. What's the first word? Yeah, but. Sorry. I love that word, <clears throat> but because that tells me that's not the end of the story. Uh, somebody once said, um, let me see if I get this right here. Somebody said, but is the, is the hinge on which great matters turn. Don't forget that because I'm going to come back to it. The word but in scripture is the hinge on which great matters turn. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. In the midst of our sin, in the midst of a pit that we dug and then we fell into, in the midst of our man-made prison, but, and you could add this word, but God, but God. So we're going to talk about that. Verse five through seven tells us um, God pulled us out of this and then he made us this. We're not going to talk about those <clears throat> because I want to focus on verse four. All right. 
It says in verse 4, but when the kindness of God our Savior, when you hear the word kindness, what does that mean to you? What does that mean? All, all things positive. Okay, good. Anything else? Let me tell you what it's not. Kindness is not moral goodness. It's not something that we can achieve. If it was moral goodness or something we can achieve, kindness would be dictated by the morals of society. I don't know if you've noticed. There ain't a whole lot of morals in our society anymore. So a kind person today was not a kind person that I would have thought was said was kind 20 years ago. All right? Um, it's not committing a kind act. All right? Kindness, and it's very important that you listen to this because it plays into the next thing, is being gentle and gracious. If I said, uh, if I were to ask you what is gracious, what does that mean? What would you say? What is gracious? Treating someone better than they deserve to be treated. Great, great way of putting it. When you spit in my face, I don't spit in yours, and I give you the best that I have. And then it says, it, it speaks of, it says, but when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appear, but God's kindness and God's love. What, what is that? When you hear the word love, what comes to mind? <coughs> it's gentleness and grace in action. It's very easy for us to say, I'm gentle and I'm gracious, but then do nothing. I can tell you all day that I'm gentle and gracious at home. There's somebody in this room who would say, sometimes he's not. <laughs> sometimes she's not either. <laughs> it's not just knowing how to be kind. It's not just knowing how to give better than what somebody deserves. It's doing it. It's doing it. And that's where I was when I told you, when I read the, the description in verse 3, I knew what kindness was, and I knew what grace was, and I knew what mercy was, because I've been taught it my whole life, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And I think sometimes we have a church full of people who know what it is, but stepping out and doing it is something different. But when the kindness and uh, was shown to us and God's love came, um, <clears throat> in verse 4, what is God called? Savior. Do you know what book of the Bible God is first called Savior in? I won't ask for the chapter and verse. I'll just ask you for the book. Exodus. Any guesses? Exodus. No. Titus? No. <laughs> no. The Old Testament. Any other guesses? You want a hint? Isaiah? No. First Samuel? No. Genesis? No. Older no. days. <laughs> Old. Psalm. Psalm. 17 7. That's the first place in the Bible. And, and some of this may depend on your version. Uh, first place in the Bible, Savior is you. And, and all versions across the board. Um, <clears throat> God's love and God's kindness come to us. And we'll talk about when that happens in just a minute. Go look back at verse 4. It says, But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind, what's the next word? Yeah. Up here. This is probably my favorite word in this verse, and I'll tell you why. I want you to think about in your mind what it must have been like to come to a manger and see a baby after an angel announced it to you. To be a wise man following a star for however long they followed it, and they come to a house and see a toddler with his mama and know there's something special. To be this dude out in the wilderness crying out about this guy who's going to come and he's going to take away sin and then you see him walking, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Think about what it must be like to have been blind from birth and the first person you see is Jesus. Think about what it must have been like to go to a well in the heat of the day because you're ashamed of the way you live and there's a guy there who changes everything. Think about a guy riding on a horse, what it must have been like to go in this Christian business 
and something knocks you off your horse and you're never the same again. God's kindness and God's love always appears to us at the most odd times. Because if you connect verse 3 and verse 4, God's love and God's kindness showed up when we were at our worst, not our best. They showed up when no one else's kindness and no one else's love would have even dreamed of helping us. He didn't wait till we were what he wanted us to be. He showed up when we were the furthest thing from it. You ever been to a concert, like a singing concert? Typically at a concert, you have this person who's trying to make it. Then you have this group who's halfway made it. Then you got DC talk, right? <clears throat> How do you know when the dude who's trying to make it and the band who's almost made it and DC talks getting ready to come on the stage? How do you know? How do you know the transition from the two to the major one? How do you know when that happened? Mm -hmm. Before that. Darkness. Darkness. Before that. People come on the stage and they clear off the wannabe stuff and they set up the already made it stuff and then the lights go out and people go nuts so you know you you expect because of what appears on the stage something is getting ready to happen God's kindness and God's love show up when we weren't looking for it does ours there are times when uh, even this week um, my daughter, 14, is not making very wise decisions. And probably the last thing I have on my mind is grace or is, is, is kindness and love. I would like to put my foot somewhere. You know what I mean? All of you have felt the same way. So don't look at me like I'm some bad person. <laughs> and that is when kindness and goodness are needed the most. Um, I'm going to draw something on the board that helps me think of this, and I will need your help for just a minute. So I need you to read out some of these words slowly to me because I can't write that. And if something is misspelled, let it go. <laughs> and if you've seen this before, act like you have. Verse 3, call out some of the things, some of the descriptive words in verse 3. Foolish. Disobedient. Led astray. Slaves. I'm going to put deceived for led astray. I think I spelled it right. What was the next one? After? Slave. Slave. Slaves to what? Slaves to pleasures. Okay. Malice. <coughs> Give me a better word. Envy. Hatred. Hatred. And envy. We'll stop there. Look at verse four. No, I'm sorry. Look at verses five through seven. Just call out some of the verse. Mercy. Rege regeneration. Mercy. For regeneration, I'll put new life. Okay. What else? Grace. Huh? Grace. Gracious. I need three more. Heirs. Heir. So does it say to what? Okay. Any more? Just justify. One more. Save. Save. Good. Here's us. Right? You agree with that? Where we were. And then we look at verse 4. And we see this. But God. He takes us from this to this. And the cool thing about this is he doesn't. We're not still fools. We're not still disobedient. We may do that sometimes. We may do foolish things. But God doesn't see this. He sees all of this. Because of this. 
So what Titus, or what Paul is saying to Titus is, when you have these masters and these people, whether they be masters or spouses or church people or people on 440 who don't know how to drive, or children, remember who you were. Remember who you are. And show them the same thing that he showed you. That easy? No, it's not. Do you think it was easy watching his son die? So the last thing that I would like for you to do, um, I gave you a cross and I was going to have you take that person's name that you thought of and write it on the, on the, on the back. I'm not going to have you do that because they may be sitting next to you. <laughs> Or they may be standing up here in front of me. But I want you to put this somewhere so that when you remember those people, because they, they're not going to go away. You remember this. You may be the hinge that opens the door for them to move from here to here. Let's pray. God, you're good to us. Father, we thank you uh, that we are no longer what we were. And while we often choose to return to Egypt, thank you that that is no longer our identity, not because of any single thing that we have done, but all because of you. Lord, each of us <coughs> can think of people. It may be one, it may be many who have just hurt us. In some respects, they have crucified us. But God, may we be the hinge that may point them to the open door where they can become heirs and righteous and justified in all of the things that you have made us. Help us to look through um, Calvary's cross to everyone that we encounter. We love you. And we thank you for your grace and mercy to us. In Jesus' name, amen.